Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So this is a tour de force. I have to cover all the insects in 45 minutes. So um, if I don't mess up, here it is. These are the insects that I will cover, I will try to cover. Uh, if I run out of uh, time, they will cut me off somewhere in, down below there. So the ones in blue are in blue because, in essence, uh, it, it drives the monitoring scheme. Uh, we need to evaluate those populations, both of the pest and their natural enemies, and make decisions if controls are needed or not. In this presentation, I will uh, emphasize primarily identification, a little bit of life cycle as it pertains to control measures, and natural enemies. So, but I'm not going to cover any insecticide treatment or anything like that. Um, so, um, with further, well, uh, further to do, I'm going to continue. So, leaf hoppers. Leaf hoppers. Now, in California, we have three species. The western grape uh, leaf uh, hopper uh, was primarily the pest that we had. It is uh, throughout California, north of the Tehachapi Mountains. Then in the 1980s, especially in San Joaquin Valley, we uh, re um, got var variegated leaf hopper. And right now in the Central Valley, variegated leaf hopper is the primary leaf hopper species. And more recently, uh, we got Virginia creeper leaf hopper. The Virginia creeper leaf hopper is uh, uh, native of um, the Chicago area, that western uh, United States. It went through Canada and then arrived Washington, and then from Washington, we got it in California in the la uh, late 1980s, and then has slowly been moving south to the point that at the, at, at, as we speak, it is in the Sacramento Valley and it's in the North Coast. In the North Coast, it is primarily in Mendocino and Lake. Um, again, it's spotted. It's not all through those uh, two counties. And uh, we have a population in uh, Pope Valley, Napa, and a population in uh, Cloverdale, Sonoma County. Um, so uh, Virginia creeper leafhopper is moving. The adults are uh, slightly hard to tell apart, especially because they move and so characters. But there are some characters that, for me, that work very, very well, especially now that I have to distinguish between Western and Virginia creeper leafhopper. Even if they're moving for, a, for Western, if I detect those two spots behind the head, those two black spots behind the head, I know I have Western. Um, variegated leafhopper is sort of mottled. Um, orangey, mottled, brownish. Um, and Virginia creeper leafhopper has a distinctive zigzag marking on the wings. So those are uh, easy to tell apart. Um, whoops. Yes. And all three species, and this is becoming in, in, very important uh, when I start talking about their natural enemies, all three species overwinter as adults. They do overwinter as adults and not as eggs. The primary damage is that they do stippling on the leaves. And the stippling uh, causes a loss of chlorophyll. Therefore, uh, it, sh sh um, if you have a big population, and that's what we are trying to avoid, we're trying to have, avoid big populations that cause defoliation. If you have defoliation, then um, probably the, there is less accumulation of sugar and the fruit doesn't ripen. The one that you do need to monitor and that you need to t know how to tell apart is the nymphs. The nymphs are small, are relatively uh, tiny. Um, in, in particular case of Western grape leaf hopper, um, nymphs, they do have markings on the backs, but unless you ha have a uh, hand lens, you won't see those markings. So usually you see it um, clear, uh, clear uh, light, um, whitish, clear yellow. Um, and one giveaway is that they march to the side. So you would see them walking to the sides on the underside of the leaves. Um, the variegated leaf hopper, um, oh, and uh, Western grape leaf hopper has two um, generations primarily in the North Coast, but in other areas of California could even have three generations a year. Variegated leaf hopper is yellowish at the beginning when it's very young, but then it takes this brownish orangey, tingy color, um, and it, depending on where you, you find yourself, uh, there is two to four 
um, generations a year. Virginia guinea pig leafhopper, the first uh, stage is indistinguishable from Western grape leafhopper. They are clear colored. But as soon as it turns to second, you start seeing those four orange spots in the thorax. Uh, and then when those, uh, uh, it becomes uh, fourth and fifth instars, those uh, orange spots turns into blood red spots. And then they're very easy to tell them apart. Um, the, even those spots, you can tell them when uh, they shed their cast skins, those spots appear like four markings on the cast skins. A little bit of the parasitoids. Uh, this is a schematic. So uh, first, I'll show you the cycle of the leafhopper. The leafhopper lays its embeds. The, in, in this case, it is Western grape leafhopper. Um, it embeds the eggs. They are uh, kidney shape, and they embed them on the underside of the leaf. And if those eggs are not parasitized, then as you see the arrow following here to the, I think it's the left, um, you see the nymph emerging, and that's a nymph that will feed on the leaves and go through five nymphal stages and turn into an adult. But we have this tiny little wasp. In fact, it is a complex of little wasps. We have more than one species. Uh, they, they, they are the anagoras complex. And this tiny little wasp lays an egg inside the egg of the leafhopper. And what you can see on that inside the egg of the leafhopper is a red blob. That is the larvae of the tiny little parasitoids. First you see it white, and then you see it red. It's the larvae that is feeding the egg from inside. Once it completes it, 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 it its development, it pupates, and it's encased inside that egg. So it needs to get out. And to get out, with the, once it turns into an adult, the little wasp, uh, makes a perfectly exit hole and flies off, finds more eggs, and parasitizes more eggs. The beauty of this system is that uh, leafhoppers take about, each brood takes about six weeks to lay eggs. So you have a six-week period. But the development of the wasp is much shorter. And so for a one six-week period, you might have three generations of anagras. So as those three generations of anagras build up, then it really suppresses the population. And this is what I tried to show in this study that I made many, many years ago, in where I follow the population of parasitism and leafhopper population in 25 vineyards. And then after I had those 25 vineyards, I looked at the percent parasitism of the first generation. And I divided it in two groups. Those vineyards where I had few parasitism, 30% or less, and those vineyards where I had a, a little bit more parasitism, 15% uh, to almost 30% for the first generation of Western grape leaf hopper brood. So once I had those two groups, then I follow the population of nymphs, the second brood. In either case, even if I had um, low parasitism, uh, which was less than 13%, or high parasitism, the second population brood came down. But it came significantly uh, further down the population when it had high percent parasitism. So in any way, if you, what the point is that if parasites come into your vineyard, and this is key, come into your vineyard early in the season for the first brood, chances are that parasitoids will take care of that population. But here is the glitch. The glitch is, as I told you, all grape, all leafhoppers that feed on grapes overwinter as adults. So if they overwinter as adults, where does the little parasitoid overwinter? It needs somebody else's eggs. And so after many, many studies done by many, many people, they know um, some of those alternate hosts for the parasitoids spending the winter. One is prunes. So prune leafhopper spends the winter as an egg. And in those eggs, the anagora spends the winter. So if you're next to a prune orchard, you probably, has a, you probably have a reservoir of uh, those parasitoids. We also know that in blackberries, the blackberries 
uh, leafhopper overwinter sex. So in riparian areas where there is blackberries, the, uh, that would be your reservoir of the parasitoid. More recent studies done by Wilson show that in chaparral, coyote bush is a reservoir of the parasitoid. So if you're next to those areas, probably the parasite invades your vineyard clo uh, early in the season, and those parasites will control your populations. Now, all eggs are not equal in these leafhoppers, unfortunately. The western grape uh, leafhopper lays single eggs, little blisters, and uh, both uh, main parasitoids, there's two main parasitoids, um, Anagoras erythronera and Anagoras dena um, attack those, those, those eggs. In the case of irrigated leafhopper, those same two uh, parasitoids attack the eggs, but these eggs are more embedded deeper in the, in the leaves, and because they're deeper in the leaves, um, they uh, have less parasitism because the, the parasites have a harder time finding them. In the case of Virginia creeper leafhopper, Virginia creeper leafhopper lays eggs in batches. A batch may have one, two, or seven side-by-side -side eggs, so each egg is laid side-by-side. -side. But on top of that, the female uh, covers that batch with a secretion, a gray secretion, and that bluish gray secretion. And that secretion deters parasitism because it gets uh, tangled in their little uh, feet. And that also on top, in Virginia creeper leafhopper, Anagoras erythronera does not attack it. So the only one that attacks it is Anagoras denai and Tetrakova. And Tetrakova is not very common, so only is parasitized by Anagoras denai. So in the absence of good parasitism, then the other control, uh, one of effective controls uh, of natural enemies is spiders. So in those valleys where they are far away from sources of Anagoras, uh, spiders is a uh, uh, good controlling of leafhopper populations. So moving on into spider mites, we do have two different species of spider mites in California. One is Willamette spider mite, and the other one is Pacific spider mite. And you may ask yourself, well, why do I care if spider mite is a spider mite? And, well, you do care because you can sustain much larger populations of Willamette spider mite than you can Pacific spider mite. And uh, for me, the EC, and so it's important to tell them apart. It's important to tell them apart early in the season too. So for me, the easiest way, and it works, um, is to, there is all characters, but for me the easiest way is to look at that first pair of legs. Because the first le pair of legs, again, you have to use a hand lens, protrudes uh, away from the body, and you can see it clearly with a hand lens. So if those first pair of legs are trans translucent or transparent, it is Willamette spider mite. If those first pair of legs are reddish, um, it, is, it is Pacific spider mite. If you really want the correct ID, unfortunately, you have to dissect the male genitalia, and it takes a slide. I can do it, but I doubt you would do it. <laughs> so we we'll have a little bit of the biology. We we'll have met spider mite. Uh, the colony, if you look at the leaf, you would see that the, uh, the, the colony is on the underside of the leaf, right? So the colony tends to, to inhabit the underside of the leaf along the vein. So from the upper side of the leaf, you would see discoloration. So, and the discoloration is yellowish discoloration on the leaf when it's a white variety and reddish when it's a red variety. So first of all that you would notice is that that discoloration is along the veins. The other thing that you would notice is that they prefer the shaded part of the canopy. So A, you find them more often in the spring and as uh, hot weather comes, they disappear. And B, you're, you're always looking for them in the shaded part of the canopy. As opposed to spider, Pacific spider mite, in that they're more clumped. 
And so the distribution in the leaf is rounder. And so that, that, that discoloration, yellow in white varieties or red in red varieties, you would be more like a circle in between the veins. And second, that it loves the, the heat. So you would find them in the sun exposed sides of the canopy. And as warm weather uh, comes, then the population can build up very, very quickly. And that's why you need to uh, know your uh, population way before uh, the hot weather starts. There are predatory mites. The predatory mites can easily be distinguished from a spider mite. First, they don't do webbing. All spider mites, spider mites do webbing. Second, instead of being round-shaped, they are uh, pear-shaped or a tear shaped um, And third, they're slightly larger, but that's not a great character. They move around in the leaf looking for a prey. So you will always find them moving very fast. Instead, spider mice are sedentary. They're under the web and they're feeding on the leaf. These guys are walking around, moving the first two pair of legs very, very fast, looking for a prey. Then the eggs are slightly uh, different in that they are oval shaped instead of being pearly round. Historically, we thought that the main predator uh, mite for us was Western predatory mite, and that is Galandromus occidentalis. And then in the mid 2000s, we did a huge survey, uh, uh, me with a bunch of other researchers all up and down. Uh, California, and these are the results just that I have from the North Coast. Um, and what you would see is that Galandromus in Italy is present, is present primarily more, more in Lake and Mendocino than uh, here, but uh, two things uh, were fascinating that I find, and this is the data from just one year. I have four years worth of data, and what is impressive is Year after year after year, in a particular vineyard, the complex of uh, predatory mice was always the same. Um, the other thing that to note is that in very cool areas is the only place where I found um, Metas uh, yeah, Neocilios California, which is the one that you call Calimite. And so Calimite, I only find it in very cool areas of Sonoma County. The most important a predator that was consistent and in huge numbers was Typhalodromus pyri. So, so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, f the feeding life lifestyle of this predator in mites. This uh, is a category that was done by a UC Riverside uh, professor uh, Mac called McMurray, and he um, describe the lifestyles of different predator mice into four types. I am not going to go through four types because I don't have the time, but uh, just to say that I am going to emphasize on type 2 and type 3. So Western predator mite is type 2, Kali mite is type 2, and that's what you would like to have. And you would like to have, because in this case there is um, a synchrony between the prey and the predator. When the prey, uh, the prey uh, starts increasing, the predator starts increasing, and they keep it in sync. So they, 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 they go up, the other go up, they bring it down, they go down, and so they are in, in sync one with the other. And that is the ideal uh, predator mite, because that will keep your population in check, and you never have to spray, you never have a problem. We have Typhilodroma, uh, Typhilodroma pyri, which is type 3 um, lifestyle. And that type 3 means that it does feed on prey, but it also does feed on pollen. But the reason I think it, Typhilodroma pyri works so well in Sonoma and Napa County, which is the most abundant, is that when you, because it feeds on pollen, when you start early in the season, they're in huge numbers. That's what one of the things that surprised me the most when I started monitoring. There, you would find 15 per leaf in April, in, in March. So what I think is going on, and I have no proof, no data to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that they're in so huge numbers that if they find an egg of the spider mites, they feed on that egg, right? 
And so it's sort of like a vaccination in a way, in that in the, as the spider mites are laying eggs, these guys are eating the eggs. And so the population never takes off. However, when it does take off for some reason, when the population of the spider mites take off, they are not good at keeping it in check. Once it gets off, but the pro, the, what I think is happening is that there is such a huge number is that the spider mites never take off. And therefore, it, it is a group. Uh, uh, and, and they are in huge numbers because they are feeding on something else. OK, moving to the millibugs. When I started this job, there was only two millibugs that I knew as a student. One was grape millibug, and the other one was, was obscure millibug. Obscure millibug is also an exotic pest, but it came in, in the 1800s. So or I think uh, so. We had those two to deal with: uh, grave millibug and obscure millibug. So in the 1990s, we got long-tailed millibug. I'm not going to cover long-tailed millibug just to say that long tails mean long tails. You can tell them apart from the other pseudococcus, the other pseudococcus being grape and obscure, by their long tails. And I will show you in the map where they are located, because they are uh, primarily. Uh, in the, in the San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara area, and they're not, even in that area, they're not the most important millibugs. So later on, we, uh, we got vine millibug, and then most recently, we got gilly millibug. So, quite a bit. Here, this is a map made by Ken Dean, and I still use it because it shows you a little bit of historically what we've, uh, what's been happening. So uh, the uh, grape millibug is primarily all those yellow areas, uh, yellow stripes. A grape millibug um, is, yeah. A and then obscure millibug is primarily found in coastal areas, in both in the north and in the south coastal areas. Again, obscure millibug comes from the tropics. It's a nursery pest primarily in orna ornamentals. Um, and so the very cold winters um, kill down the population or bring the populations down. Uh, long tail is found in San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara. Again, that started in the mid 1990s. And then, oops. And then we got vine millibug. So vine millibug uh, that is from the Mediterranean is not from this area, but it came from Mexico. First in Cochuela Valley in 1994, then it jumped to uh, Kern County in 1998, and um, then it has been slowly moving uh, throughout California. Again, it's still hid hidden mess. Some vineyards would have it, and other vineyards won't have it. So it's spotty, but it is spreading. Um, and then more recently, we got Gill's millibug. Gill's millibug is a pest in the Central Valley of almonds, pistachios, and pomegranates. But we uh, only seen it, uh, e even though there's grapes in all the San Joaquin Valley next to all those crops, uh, it's only considered up to now a pest in grapes in the Sierra foothills and in a very, uh, some valleys of Lake County. That's where Gili Milibak is a problem. And that started in the mid-2000s. We started seeing uh, problems with Gili Milibak in those areas. So. How to tell them apart? First, how to tell the uh, pseudococcus apart, be, especially between grape millibug and obscure millibug. In this case, the body is um, rectangular. Um, so the, the sides of the nymphs or, or females are parallel sides with round ends, right? And then all around the body, they have uh, hairs. And in those hairs, the waxy material accumulates and it gives you the, 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 the impression that it has a fringe around the body and tails. And the, the tails and the fringe um, are relatively longer than in vine millibug because those hairs are longer. Um, the way you can tell the grape millibug and the obscure millibug is using a, def uh, is using a trick. In essence, you have to bother them with something, but not very something very, um, you, you do have to needle them, but not very strongly. Because if you needle them strongly, 
you kill them, and then you get the gut content, and that f messes you up. But what you want to, to, to make them do is you want to, for them to excrete their defensive fluid. So they have uh, some pores where those uh, defensive fluids come out. Uh, it's a way of defending themselves. And if the fluid is orangey color, then it's grape millibug. It, if it's clear color, then it, it is obscure millibug. I also can tell them by their biology. Because as I will go through the biology shortly, grape millibug is very well synchronized. So by synchronized, what do I mean? You first see the eggs, then you see later on, days go by, you see the, the crawlers, then the nymphs, then the adults. You don't see overlapping of stages at one point, and you will see it in the biology. Obscure millibug, because it's a tropical bug, doesn't have diapause. And if it doesn't have diapause, at all the time, at all times, we have all the stages at the same time. So especially in the spring, when I go and, and, and look at it and see everything, I see eggs, nymphs, adults, I already suspect that it is obscure millibug. And then I poke them, and they tell me who they are. Separating vine millibug from grape millibug, the vine millibug is more oval shape, and they have that fringe around the body, but those hairs are much shorter, and therefore the, 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 the wax accumulates, the, 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 hair, the fringe appears to be thicker, but it's just that wax accumulating, um, and the tails on the back are short. Um, so. so Okay, the, a little bit of the life stages. Um, the the pseudococcus or, or the millibug long tail complex. The grape has two generations per year. The stages are um, synchronized, and they produce honeydew but moderate amounts. Obscure millibug has two to three generations per year, depending on where you are in the in the in the state. Um, the stages overlap um, through the year and they produce moderate to high um, amounts of honeydew. Vine millibug, obviously with short tails, may have between three to seven generations. Here in the North Coast, I think we have about four. Um, the stages overlapped, and I will show you in a second. They, uh, they produce excessive amount of honeydew, especially if ants are not present, so excessively that it forms like uh, sugar blocks. Um, and it feeds throughout the canopy. This is a key thing. It not only feeds throughout the canopy, it lays eggs throughout the canopy. Um, and in very light soils, especially in Southern California, it feeds on the roots. So the, a little bit of uh, the grape, leaf, uh, grape millibug life cycle. It overwinters as eggs. And right about this, this time is when, in February, is when I start looking for the crawlers. So when I look for the crawlers, uh, I go to the spurs in a sunny day, and, and then you, you peel that very thin uh, bark there that is in the spurs, and you will see them sunning themselves there. Obviously, you go to a place where you have historical problems of grape millibug. That's uh, what you would tend to do. So those crawlers then, as soon as the shoots come out and the leaves come out, will move into the leaves, and we develop uh, several, the, the two, three nymphal stages. And then when the female um, turns into an adult, when the nymph turns into a female, they move back to, the females move back to the cordon and the trunk to lay their eggs. They do not lay their eggs on their canopy. This is very different from buying minibug. So they come back. Uh, and, and then you have that second generation. Again, like uh, you see, it's very synchronized. You don't see the <coughs> multiple stages. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, they come back to lay their eggs. Probably in late May, they start coming back. Um, in, in June, and then those crawlers start moving back to the canopy in late, late June, early July. And now they go to the leaves, but they also go to the clusters, and they develop there. Some females might lay eggs on the cluster, but the majority of the females go back to the bark and lay those eggs 
that those are the eggs that will overwinter. So if you had to control, if you needed to control uh, these insects, the best time to control them is when you have crawlers, either early in the spring or uh, late June, early July. Uh, again, monitoring the spurs is crucial early in the spring. It is very well controlled by natural enemies. It not only has a big complex of at least five uh, parasitoids, the parasitoid lays the egg on a nymph, the, that parasitoid develops inside that nymph and again makes a perfectly uh, uh, round exit hole and goes out as a little wasp goes uh, around parasitizing more nymphs. And also another great uh, predator, are, there are several species of little beetles. This one is Millibug destroyer, Cryptolemus montesi, um, that feed primarily on the eggs. And it would feed on the eggs of any uh, millibug, vine millibug, grape millibug, obscure millibug. So that's another source of very good control. So in essence, grape millibug is very well controlled by natural enemies, except on the occasions that the natural enemies are disrupted by insecticide or when you have high populations of Argentine ants. Vine millibug life cycle, quite different. Um, it depends on where you are in California. In this area, they overwinter as second and third nymphs uh, at, the, at the graft union. In uh, Southern California, with uh, uh, more sandy soils, you can find them in the roots. And then that first generation um, come the spring in March develops, uh, the, in March and April, the first generation of millibugs develop under the bark. Um, and then about May, they start moving into the canopy. And now when they move to the canopy, they don't go back. So as nymphs and, and adults move to the canopy, the females will lay eggs in the canopy. So if you see eggs in the canopy, it's probably vine millibug, for sure. Well, probably. Um, so now you can have, depending on where you are in California, between three and seven generations. And uh, A, you want to avoid to have those populations in the canopy because of contamination uh, uh, of the fruit, because of leaf roll. But also, if you have that contamination when the leaves fall, there's an easy way of spreading it to other vineyards. We uh, think, or we know, that uh, vine millibug came to the North Coast on uh, nursery stock. So in 2002, we detected nursery stock that was infected, and then we traced it back. And we think that since nine, probably since 1998 to 2002, uh, it, that, that's when both Napa and Sonoma got infested. Um, there is a way of hot water treat uh, the nursery stock so that you don't get vine millibug. But unfortunately, I would say that uh, late in 2000, whatever, 15, 14, we started seeing that nursery stock was again contaminated with vine millibug. Um, you could possibly say perhaps it was always, but we didn't notice. We started noticing it again in 2015. And unfortunately, even until 2018, we had uh, infested shipments. So we strongly recommend the uh, growers that when they're getting uh, green growing vines, that they inspect those flats. We uh, recommend that you inspect every single flat and that you inspect at least two vines per flat. Vine millibug has a, a parasitoid. It's called Anajarus pseudococcus. And it can reach very high levels. You can get at the end of the season, at the end of the summer, and in the fall, almost 80% parasitisms. These studies were done in San Joaquin Valley, but you can get that parasitism levels here too. The, the problem is that it, it, when it overwinters, it doesn't appear in the vineyard until May. So that first generation that I told you develops in the trunk, that first generation goes unchecked and therefore populations build up. You can monitor all these millibugs with pheromone lures. Um, they, it, there was a question and, and somebody mentioned that they do this. Um, so depending what lure you have is what male you're gonna catch. 
But still, you need to, to learn how to identify those snails. And the reason why you, they're tiny, you need a, a, a dissecting scope to see them, because they're the size of a pepper, a piece of pepper. And, and you need to know the, the difference in species, um, because sometimes you get blunders. Even you put a pheromone of grape, you still might get vine, or vice versa, if the populations are high um, of the one that you're not trying to monitor. And also we have other mealybug species. We have grass mealybug species, and the males might blunder in. And you don't want to count something that is not what you're trying to count. We do put trainings on that, so we can do that. Gilly mealybug. Gilly mealybug has been studied primarily by Ling Wanderlick because it uh, is a pest of the I have 10 minutes. <laughs> um, it's a pest of the uh, Sierra foothills. Um, it's oval shed, flat. It has a pink color. The body has a pink color. And then when it covers them, itself with wax, um, and sometimes you see the pink uh, color of the body comes through, it looks like striped. So at the beginning, it was confused with striped millibug, but it isn't. It's killing millibug. But the distincting character is that it uh, puts out these the filaments, the, the glassy filaments, um, all around their body. And this insect, um, unlike the other pseudocopos or vine millibag, instead of laying the egg um, on, uh, as egg masses, they have the eggs inside the female of the body, and the eggs hatch inside the female of the body. So what comes out, and you see in this picture, is the crawlers. The crawlers are coming live outside um, because they hatch inside the female. Uh, here is a male billybug. It's a quite huge uh, in, in gilly millibugs. It's a male billybug. Um, the male billybugs have wings, fly, and look for females and mate. So in the spring, in May, those females move to the spurs. And then those crawlers start coming out of those females. And they move into the leaves. And if you need to treat them, this is the time you treat them. You treat them when those crawlers are moving to the leaves before they get into the clusters. So uh, as season goes by, um, in July and August, the, uh, the gills enter the, the clusters. And then you have the second generation. And with the second generation, you have more honeydew and more untending. And then finally, uh, the overwintering nymphs move to the bark and overwinter uh, uh, under the bark. There are half parasitoids that attack them. And so again, those parasitoids may put an egg inside the nymphs. The nymphs uh, develop inside. And then you see that they were parasitized by the perfectly exit hole of the wasp coming out. You see parasitize uh, nymphs um, most commonly um, under the grapevine trunk uh, in, in the spring. And then also you see them uh, uh, later on at, during harvest. So population of parasitoids can control populations of gills minibug. Oof, the worm in 10 minutes, the impossible. Uh, berry feeders, the European grapevine moth, um, we, the European grape mammoth, as the name comes, it comes from Europe. Um, they feed inside berries. That's why they're called berry feeders. Um, uh, we had, uh, we detected it in 2009 in Napa, Sonoma, in Northern California primarily. Um, we uh, placed an eradication program. The last moth was caught in 2014. In 2016, it was declared eradicated. And since then, we have not caught. The last moth was 2014. We, the, the ACO commissioner continues to monitor, and we have not detected any more. So the first generation uh, develops in the flower, because the, the female lay the egg close to the flower, and first generation feeds on the flower. The second and third generation feed on the berries. So they lay single eggs on berries, and each uh, little larvae might affect three to five berries. But if the female lays many eggs in the cluster, the whole cluster could be affected. But one larvae only feeds on three to five larvae. Then we have the leaf rollers. In the leaf roller, we have three, three different species in California. Um, the orange totrix and light brown apple moth are very, very similar 
both in their biology and how they look like. And they are primarily like very cool summers. So where you have high humidity, Carneros area, or Russian River, um, you uh, have problems with orange lot drift. Omnivorous leaf roller is the primary leaf roller in the Central Valley. It likes warm valleys. It's also found in coastal areas in warm valleys, in the coastal areas. The damage of the leaf rollers is that they feed and form nests down the, 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 the reikis and take bites at berries. And when they take bites at berries, depending on the climate, you may or may not have rot. But you've got to have rot if you have high humidity. Five minutes. Very hard to tell or orange todrix from light uh, brown apple moth. The way I do it is I rear them because I gave up on trying to tell the larvae apart. And of course, um, that's where you find them. You find them in the same area, so you have to tell them apart, and I do it by rearing them. In the case of omnivorous leaf roller, it's very easy to tell them apart. First, because when they're little, the head capsule is black. Then as they grow, the head capsule is brown with a, a marking here. But the most sailing character is um, where the hair, they have hairs on their body, where the hairs meet the body. Where the hair meet the body, you have a tubercle, and that tubercle is oval shaped in the case of omnivorous leaf roller, and it's round in the case of the other two. The males, you tell them apart in the traps because of the lure that you place. Um, the, the, the orange tortrix has a distinctive V-shaped marking on the back of the wings. The omnivorous leaf, leaf roller has a distinct snout. And the light brown apple moss has a lot of uh, different um, colorations. It has a little bit of a V-shaped marking. They can also be two-toned. And there's more examples of a lot of dis difference. But the way you tell them apart is because in the wings, and this is the outer edge of the wing, we call the coastal uh, edge, um, they have a fold. So if you see a coastal fold, it's definitely brown, light brown upper moth and not any other of the other moths. Am I running out of time? Three minutes? Okay. So those are the leaf rollers. The leaf rollers are very well controlled with natural enemies including light brown apple moth. That's um, amazing, but light brown apple moth uh, that is, uh, came from Australia, it came here in 2007, it's very well controlled by little wasps um, that suppresses the population uh, on some years, not on all years. Grape leaf holder is also an exotic pest. Um, it, it, it came from the East Coast, uh, but it came in through the East Coast in the 1900s, so it's been here. It's, found in very warm valleys, but it's hit and miss. You would have outbreaks, and then they disappear. And then you have another outbreak years afterwards, and then they disappear. Um, the larvae can be tell apart because they have two markings here on, lat on the sides of the body, uh, right about where the second pair of legs are. Um, at the beginning, uh, early, they have three generations a year, and at the beginning, they start gluing two leaves together where they form nests below. And at the beginning, they feed in groups. And so what you start detecting and what you should be very good at detecting is this window painting. That's when they're feeding on the other side and they're leaving the, the window painting. That's the first indication that you have them. In. And then they start rolling the leaves. Um, as population increase, if they're not checked by their natural enemies, you can have very high populations and you can have defoliation. So that's crucial to start monitoring. And when you start monitoring for them, you unroll the roll and you look for a parasitoid. And in this case, the parasitoids are external parasitoids. What do I mean by that? The little wasp lays an egg on top of the body of the larvae. They don't put it inside the larvae, but on top. So here are the eggs an external parasitoid. And here are the larvae of the parasitoid, those eggs hatch into those larvae, and they consume that uh, uh, leaf folder larvae. And that's what you want to see. I think that uh, this parasitoid is the reason why some years they do not have uh, problems and other years they do have uh, problems. 
uh, especially in the Central Valley. Again, um, in our area, this guy is in Lake County, in very hot valleys of Lake County. <coughs> Western grape leaf uh, follows skeletal racer, or again an exotic pest. This one came from uh, the southwest. Um, it became a problem in the 1960s in the San Joaquin Valley. Lays the eggs um, very orderly, and then the, when those eggs hatch, the larvae feed side by side. Um, and then as they grow, they, they, they change coloration from orangey coloration to banded with uh, purple coloration. These are the adults, and the adults fly uh, during the day, so you can visit, uh, see them through the day. They overwinter as pupa, then the adults emerge, lay eggs, and the first thing you, you have to monitor for is for this um, discoloration. First you see it like nickel size. Uh, white discoloration. What they are doing is they are sclerotizing the leaf on the underside, and that's the first indication. And they lay eggs on mature leaves. So you would see this uh, primarily on the basal leaves. Um, uh, and then if unchecked, the populations can build up uh, and you get defoliation. They have very good natural control. They have a, a tachinid um, fly that attacks the larvae. There is also uh, a parasitoid that attacks uh, the larvae. Um, but the most important and the most important <coughs> control measure is the virus. They have a granulosis virus and when the larvae feeds on it, um, it eventually dies. And you can see not, not only that eventually the larvae dies, that those that survive, then those adults can be infested. And then when the adults lay eggs, they lay uh, eggs disorganized. <coughs> And then the, the, or the larvae start wandering around. Um, and as they wander, they pooped. And they pooped the granulosis virus. Other larvae feed them, and so on. So the virus is a, an excellent control of grape leaf sclerodonizer. It, it is primarily the Central Valley. Whenever we get it in the North Coast, the Ag Commissioner, either of Napa or Sonoma, has eradicated. So on occasions in my career, uh, we got it here in the North Coast, but the Ag Commissioner tries to eradicate. Shall I stop? Let me go to the final resources. This is our Bible, the Great Pest Management Manual. Uh, the third edition was um, done uh, by Larry Berica, was the editor. And so it's a very thick book that I have back there. And that's all what I tried to tell you in 45 minutes. So if you want more information, that then we have these cards. The, the vineyard pest identification cards. Um, there is a, an English version and a Spanish version um, that, as the title says, it gives you tips on identification and tips on monitoring. And very recently, they made it electronically. So if you are a Mac person, you buy the um, iBook and if you version. And if you are not a Mac person, you buy the other version. And finally, the last uh, resource here is the IPM website. The IPM website is the one that has all the best management guidelines with how to control these insects. And I will leave the questions for uh, when we all meet uh, later. <laughs>